Hello, everyone, and welcome to workshop nine uh, today um, for NACFC 2021. Um, we are going to be talking about airway innate immunity today. Um, my name is Dr. Katie Heiser, and I am chairs with Dr. Ray Pickles, who is the behind the scenes today. Um, we are really excited today to welcome five excellent talks. Um, I'm going to just start with a quick screen share to orient everyone um, to today's session. Um, so, as I said, workshop nine, airway innate defense, um, we have no disclosures from the moderators. Um, before we get to the speakers, I'm going to make a quick plug. Um, I am one of the chairs of the best uh, abstract junior investigator in basic science competition. Um, and this normally happens at NACFC, but will not be happening this week because of timing. Um, I just want to give a plug that the final competition um, will happen on Wednesday, November 17th at 11 a.m. Um, uh, to 12.30 p.m. Eastern time with these finalists. So we already had 10 people go in with their posters and we selected five, one of whom you'll be hearing with from today in this session. Um, if you have questions about this content, you can contact me or you can email Catherine Tuggle at the foundation for the link, but we would really love people to come. This is a live competition um, on Wednesday, November 17th. Um, so after that shameless promotion, um, I'll get straight to our session. Um, we have five great talks that cover various aspects of innate immunity. Um, and so we'll start with talking about epithelial cells, um, and then we're gonna move into macrophages and neutrophils and end by talking about resolvents. So before I take up any more time from our speakers, uh, we'll start off with Dr. Vladar. And I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, my name is Esther Vladar from the University of Colorado, and I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to present our work on the uh, cyanonasal epithelial transcriptional and functional responses to highly effective CFTR modulator therapy. I have no disclosures. So I will start right away with the problem that we're trying to address, which is the extensive structural and functional defects that exist in the cystic fibrosis airway epithelium. This is shown very nicely by the scanning electron microscopy images of the surface of the turbinates. The healthy airway epithelium is robustly ciliated, while the airway surface from the single CF donor is highly variable in appearance, um, ranging from nearly normal um, uh, to highly abnormal with um, mucous metaplasia and denudation of the airway epithelium. So these um, focal structural and functional changes are collectively termed remodeling, which underlies CF disease phenotypes and is associated with CF disease progression. There's also evidence that some type or extent of remodeling may be irreversible. So um, uh, I want to point out that our study focused exclusively on the CF cyanonasal epithelium, and it's important to note that the relationship of that, the relevance of that to lower airway disease um, is still up for debate. I will also briefly mention that the remodeling phenotypes in the in vivo airways are also reflected in um, primary cultured airway epithelial cells generated from stem cells isolated from the donor tissue, and that we will use this model um, to study functional outcomes. So while remodeling um, mechanisms are not completely clear and likely to be complex, this is how I think about how it evolves and how correctors um, may impact it. So in CF, we start in early life with a dysfunctional CF your ion channel, which leads to the buildup of difficult to clear mucus, which leads to um, a vicious cycle of um, infection, inflammation, epithelial injury, and a barren repair, um, which with turnover leads to remodeling. And it remains unknown to what extent CF here modulator therapy, which in this case, I will be referring to um, the uh, triple combination of Alexacaftor, Tazacaftor, Ivacaftor, is able to rectify these changes, especially when initiated in an adult population with established disease. So to address this issue, um, here's the study we carried out in collaboration with Dr. Jen Taylor Kauser at National Jewish Health and Dr. Dan Beswick now at UCLA. Um, uh, we enrolled an adult po population of uh, people with CF, studied them at baseline, um, and six months after studying modulator therapy to test a hypothesis that this will lead to improvements in CF-related uh, CF chronic rhinosinusitis, improvement in patient-related outcomes, and changes in cyanonasal airway epithelial gene expression and function. 
So results from our first two aims have already been published. And the focus of this talk is the work carried out by my lab on the third aim. So briefly, um, we collected nasal brush biopsies at baseline and uh, six months um, after modulator therapy. The right brush was um, used to compare gene expression with uh, bulk ultrasgryptome sequencing, and the left brush was used to isolate and expand airway epithelial cells for primary culture. Um, in total, we have matched baseline and six-month samples from uh, 25 subjects. So before we get into the results, I would like to briefly review the makeup of our study population. So it consisted of um, uh, CF adults with eligible CFDR genotypes that had a range of lung disease and sinus disease severities. Um, this table here shows some of the published clinical and patient reported outcomes, which indicate that true to its name, highly effective modulator therapy leads to uh, substantial improvements in virtually all metrics, including sinus CT opacification as an indicator of CF-related CRS. So based on these results um, and previous experience with correctors, we had several hypotheses for the transcriptional and functional responses of the underlying sinonasal airway epithelium. First, we expected our data to parallel the clinical outcomes and to show reduced inflammation and improved epithelial structure and function. Second, we expected to see a pretty variable response. Um, I, and third, that the epithelium is not going to be fully restored, which we tested by including a handful of healthy donor samples we were able to collect during COVID. So before I get into the data, I want to recognize that this type of analysis would not have been possible without really the decades of hard work from the research community in identifying the uh, key players and mechanisms that um, the knowledge that we leverage from both the healthy and the CF airways. So to start off with a big picture look at our gene expression data from the combined cohort, um, we got about 1,500 differentially expressed genes from baseline to six months, and pathway analysis revealed that, very satisfyingly, um, I, it was dominated by reduced inflammatory gene expression, which you can see here. As we hypothesized, we detected gene expression that is consistent with reduced neutrophilic inflammation and improved epithelial structure and function. And this is really um, nicely illustrated by these two heat maps that um, show gene expression changes for our neutrophil and our ciliated cell gene expression master lists. So to orient you with these heat maps, um, uh, what we're looking at here is um, gene expression um, uh, that um, uh, is increased expression is illustrated in red, decreased expression in blue. Um, I, and as you can see here is that most of the neutrophil genes are downregulated, while the opposite is true for the ciliated cell genes. So each one of the genes are represented in rows and the subjects are in columns. And it is also immediately obvious that the subject response is heterogeneous. And in each case, we have some subjects with the opposite response. Um, so the heterogeneity in the subject population is really nicely illustrated by the hierarchical clustering analysis that we carried out, based on which we identified four subject clusters, which we are calling A, B, C, and D. And this was based on genes that um, themselves clustered into six clusters. So we identified um, uh, three inflammatory gene expression clusters to um, epithelial clusters, and one cluster related to um, uh, protein expression and trafficking, which was turned on in all subjects. And it is quite apparent from this heat map um, uh, that subjects in cluster A are quite a bit different from the um, B through D subject clusters. And what chiefly sets them apart is increased inflammation after six months of corrector therapy. So based on these data, we decided to designate our A subjects as our transcriptional um, non-responders and our B through D subjects as our transcriptional responders, again, based on the fact that they have decreased inflammation and improved epithelial dysfunction. So we carried out extensive analysis to see if there is correlation between our transcriptional data and any of the subject characteristics and clinical and patient reported outcomes from the same subject. 
patients. So here we're um, focusing on the two critical metrics of FEV1 and um, percent sinus opacification, which is a measure um, uh, of sinus disease severity by CT scan. So here you can see the red is indicating um, on the CT scans um, opacification. And we see substantial statistically significant improvement in um, virtually um, all of our subjects, but we only detected significant correlation um, with our transcriptional data for sinus disease severity. And in fact, we were able to narrow this down to a single gene, um, PROC2, which is the uh, most highly differentially expressed gene in our data set. Um, it is uh, uh, a gene that is um, reduced in the responders. Its function is not clear, um, but it's been shown to be upregulated in neutrophils and by GCSF during inflammation, and it has already been shown to be highly expressed in the CF lung. And what we suggest is that this represents the reduction of neutrophilic inflammation in the responders. Um, we also wanted to know whether um, uh, this is actually consistent with the reduced recruitment of neutrophils to the CF airway after corrector treatment. So we took advantage of um, computational estimation of cell type proportions in the baseline versus six month um, uh, nasal brush sample. So again, this is a, um, a challenging thing to do from bulk transcriptomes, um, but we took advantage of CyberSort X and carried out imputation based on cell type, um, uh, cell type signatures defined by single cell sequencing studies um, of the healthy lung, as well as immune cells found in CF sputum. So we found that um, uh, there were fewer neutrophils um, at six months than at baseline, but only in our transcriptional responders, as you can see from this um, uh, chart here that is broken down by our cluster of responders and non-responders. With respect to epithelial cells, um, uh, we saw an increase in ciliated cells um, from baseline to six months and a decrease in goblet cells. Finally, we show, um, so here we in blue, we have some healthy donors, that the six month samples are intermediate between the baseline and the healthy donor proportions. So we conclude based on these data um, uh, that our responders have likely fewer infiltrating neutrophils and cell type proportion changes that are consistent with reduced mucosal metaplasia in the epithelium. Um, we further investigated inflammatory gene expression by focusing on a master list we generated for cytokines, chemokines, and this heat map shows a um, subset of those that were significantly differentially expressed um, specifically in our responder population. Many of these have been shown to play a prominent role in CF inflammation and are known to be expressed by both immune and epithelial cells. So um, I especially want to draw your attention to the bottom three genes, which are the most strongly downregulated genes in the responders. Um, it is hard to determine from bulk transcriptomic data if these changes are due to varying cell type frequencies in a mixed population where actual gene expression changes consistent with reduced inflammatory programming. So for example, um, uh, IL-1 beta, which is strongly downregulated, um, uh, is known to be expressed by both macrophages and neutrophils. Um, and we confirmed this by looking at CF sputum single cell expression and enrichment. And since we actually detected an increased proportion of macrophages at, um, uh, in the responders at six months, we believe that um, these gene expression changes, the downregulation is actually consistent with reduced inflammatory programming in these cells at six months. Um, so I want to finish by talking about epithelial cell gene expression and function. Um, what I have shown you before is that there is this inverse relationship we demonstrated between inflammatory and epithelial gene expression, which is really nicely illustrated by this um, chessboard uh, heat map um, when we're looking at um, genes enriched in ciliated cells versus um, neutrophils. This suggests that perhaps our non-responders are, are, are still looking like this and our responders are um, maybe looking more improved in terms of their epithelial structure. So we wanted to find evidence that this is actually driven potentially by altered cellular programming and not just changes that could be um, explained by altered cell proportions in our samples from different individuals um, or from baseline to six months.
And we think that this is nicely illustrated by um, a significant decrease in um, responders and genes driving an aberrant keratinization program in the airway epithelium, which you can see here. Um, keratinization is a um, hallmark of remodeling, and IL-36 gamma has been newly proposed as a driver of this program. What we have noted is also a decrease in IL-36 uh, um, uh, gamma in our transcriptional responders. Um, uh, it is, um, uh, has been identified recently as a driver of this keratinization program, and we are supporting this with a high correlation between um, uh, keratinization genes like involucrin um, and IL-36 gamma. Um, in the responders, and we're hoping to explore this in the future more deeply. Uh, finally, I wanted to show you a little bit about the primary cell culture data that um, uh, we have for the study. So as I mentioned before, we use the air liquid interface primary cell culture model um, uh, in order to generate cultures from paired baseline and six month passage one airway epithelial stem cells. For this, we used a homemade culture media, um, uh, which is not um, overly supportive of differentiation like some commercial formulations. And it consistently shows reduced differentiation in CF cultures, which you can see here in this um, uh, top-down confocal microscopy image showing um, ciliated cells and epithelial junctions. We found that um, uh, consistent with our transcriptional data, six-month cultures had not only improved differentiation, which you can see here by an increased number of FOXJ1 positive ciliated cells, but they had a um, uh, better organized epithelium res uh, reflected by more evenly shaped um, uh, epithelial junctions. And in fact, this is um, really clearly indicated by the donors that we've recovered where the baseline cultures occasionally just failed and are not so rich homemade media. So what we're looking at here is a top graph that shows um, uh, ciliated cells in the bottom graph, which shows barrier function for the same cultures by an epithelial voltmeter. Um, uh, the red bars here are the baseline data and the green are the six month samples. And additionally, and we also treated the same samples with corrector compounds during the culture. And as you can see from these graphs, while many of the baseline cultures struggled, the six month samples all survived, differentiated, and had better barrier function, indicating that the stem cells um, uh, were derived from an overall more normal epithelium in response to corrector therapy. So in summary, um, uh, what I told you today is that um, we found that triple combination CFPR modulator treatments seem um, to lead to an improvement, but not full rectification of the chronic inflammatory airway epithelial remodeling that correlates with sinus disease improvements, but not with FEV1, and that this response is heterogeneous among the subjects. Um, we are following up on uh, these studies with our year two time port, which um, we're collecting right now. Um, uh, and we are also analyzing these samples that were resequenced using ribodepletion um, uh, for RNA-seq, which will allow us to look at non-coding as well as some pathogen-derived transcripts. Um, we're also analyzing banked epithelial washes for secreted proteins um, uh, that may correlate with um, our transcriptional outcomes. And we're very interested in comparing these data to similar studies focusing on other materials or other compartments. So with this, I would like to um, uh, acknowledge again my collaborators on this study, um, uh, especially um, Austin Gillen and Matt Strand, who have provided a tremendous amount of assistance with bioinformatics. Katie Heisert, who um, uh, has been a fount of knowledge in um, CF inflammation and inflammatory responses, and Max Saul from my lab, who assisted with um, the airway epithelial cultures and um, the microscopy, and like to thank the funding sources that supported these studies. Thank you very much. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Dr. Vladar. There are a lot of questions already in the chat, so I will dive right into them. Um, you, you mentioned a little bit about um, what keratinization means in your understanding of the epithelial cells. You said it correlates with remodeling. One of the questions was, could that be an indication for squamous metaplasia? And can you talk a little bit more about what keratin keratinization patterns are? 
basically sort of the um, remodeling phenotype that it is correlated with. So it um, uh, IL-36 gamma um, uh, has now been shown to turn on an entire cellular programming that leads to dyskeratinization, cornification in an aberrant fashion within remodeled airway epithelia. And the question is, that um, uh, whether these types of changes may be reversed um, by either changes in the cellular environment or changes in the programming. So that I think is the, the sort of critical next step to understand with that program. Um, I'm gonna, these questions are gonna jump around between your yep. patients and your epithelial cells and your innate cells, uh, immune cells. Um, one of the questions uh, in the chat, which I was also interested in is, do you know if the non-responders at a, a transcriptional level are also non-responders in lung functions or patient outcomes? Yeah, so that was a part of the correlation study that we did is that um, I, we demonstrated that as far as um, transcriptional changes um, within our study for all of the subjects, and the relationship between the extent of um, uh, sinus opacification as a metric of um, sinus-related CRF, there is a correlation there. So one of the things that we're really um, interested in understanding is potentially, was there maybe a um, uh, sort of viral infection event that may have led to the increased inflammation that we detected transcriptionally within those subjects. And this is one thing that we're hoping to address with the um, assessment of pathogen related transcripts within our transcriptome, given that we're not able to, with the samples that we collected, do a uh, proper microbiome analysis. Um, next question uh, refers to the use of CyberSort. Um, to impute cell types. Are you confirming yeah. these imputations by any single cell RNA-seq? Um, yes, we are. So we are in the process of um, I, carrying out the initial analysis of a um, I, 10 healthy versus 10 CF donors who were on modulators. So this was going to be an important corollary to the study, which um, unfortunately fell victim to a uh, specimen collection during COVID. We were not able to capture um, a, a sort of baseline versus six month cohort for a single cell, but we do have matched bulk and single cell transcriptomes that we're currently analyzing. That's going to address both the comparison to the healthy specimens that we have and validate, hopefully, our CyberSort results. Yeah, I think many of us can be familiar with specimen collection during COVID going off the rails, so we empathize with that. Um, do you know, and, and are your studies designed at all to know what the neutrophil recruitment factors um, are that are lost with modulator therapy that might be leading to you seeing fewer neutrophils? So that's something that um, I, uh, forms one of the basis of the, the collaborations that we have going on with um, uh, Dr. Heiser at National Jewish. And what we're hoping to understand is that these signatures will appear sort of as um, uh, sort of concurrently regulated program. So one of the things that we have done is um, to uh, carry out WGCNA analysis for um, uh, co-regulated module analysis. And um, uh, we're, we're starting to see support of these sort of broader regulatory networks um, uh, sort of extending the narratives that we hypothesized. Um, do you know, I mean, can you speak at all to is, are the changes that you're seeing in the sinuses and, um, nose, uh, epi nasal epithelia, do they seem to correlate with what people think is happening in the lung? Do you think that the, in this context, this is a good correlate for, uh, lower airway epithelia, or do you think this is a different phenomenon? So I think that that's, that, that still remains a million dollar question. So I think that, um, I, I am. Personally, I would say a firm believer in the unified airway hypothesis. So um, I, I, I would say probably these changes are reflecting um, what may be happening more globally um, in that context. Um, I, 
what we have found statistically significant correlations with were the um, sinus disease, but not FEV1. Um, there could be issues related to our sample size. So we may be not power to detect those changes. FEV1 may not be the appropriate metric that we need to correlate with. Um, and then obviously we need to be mindful of potentially um, what portions of the lower airway tree we're extrapolating to, given that they're not equally affected. A uh, question about heterogeneity in your responders. Um, do you think it is um, intrinsic to patient biology and will be able to characterize uh, who's going to be a responder and a non-responder moving forward, triage assays to understand who's going to respond to therapies? So I think that that's obviously an incredibly big motivator for, for <laughs> moving forward, right? And one of the things that we're really doing separately is to fully characterize the baseline transcriptomes of the individuals as a, as a group. Um, I, I would think probably disease severity um, I, and, and sort of past disease history that sort of lends itself to a certain amount of airway epithelial damage from sort of my very airway epithelial centric point Point of view is probably going to be important in terms of the extent of remodeling that they're starting with. Um, but obviously, time will tell whether we can um, uh, use this for any type of prognostication or determination for when these types of therapies can be, should be initiated. So get, getting to a, a, even the bigger question, um, what is your hypothesis for what is the future of, of an adult with CF who has established sinus disease who starts modulator? Where do you see their sinus disease going over decades? Are they going to ever have normal airway epithelia? Or what, what do you think from these studies? What's your anticipated theory. <laughs> so, um, I mean, then, and this is something that we're hoping to address with our, our two-year cohort, which we're collecting right now, sort of as a, 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 the next step in the analysis. I think that one of the critical questions will be is, um, uh, as patients are looking forward to extended lifespans, um, uh, is sort of the, the quality and the integrity of the stem cell population that they're entering that period with. And that's a major, major uh, line of investigation in my lab right now is to try to understand to what extent um, the composition and the, the programming of the stem cell pool is um, uh, impacted by modulators. Well, that is excellent. I think, uh, did I miss any further questions in the chat? Um, I think that's, that's what we got time for as well. So we'll move to the next talk. We have Dr. Lee also talking about airway epithelia, but lower airway epithelia. And interestingly, are small airways different? Hello, I'm Michelle Pong Lee from Michigan State University. Thanks for the organizing committee to give us opportunity to present our research uh, here. The title of Mary's presentation is Electrolyte Transport Property Assay Revealed Less Carbocal Stimulator Short Circuit Current in Cultured Human Small Airway Epithelia. I have no relationship to disclose. Why study small airway in CF? Pathological and clinical data suggest that CF lung disease is initiated in distal small airways. Surface area of small airways is bigger than large airways. Particles and bacteria impact in the small airways. How to define small airways? The definition could be vague, as large and small is a relative concept. It is unclear how species or age can affect the definition. For adult human, it is defined as following inner diameter less than two millimeter, lack of complete cartilage ring support, lack of submucosal gland. Due to the importance of small airways in the uh, sea of lung disease, there are several methods to study small airways in the past, including microperfusion, micro Wilson chamber, and the primary cell cultures. The obstacle to study small areas are following. It is very technically challenging. Small areas are not very easy to access. It's difficult to isolate enough epithelial cells for primary culture. Using the recent advanced technology of single cell RNA-seq, the UNC group found that there are some difference 
in cellular composition in human large and small areas. Compared to large airways, there's more secretory cells but less ionocytes in the small airways. In addition, there is often to show that the differences in innervation of human large and small areas. In the left panel, this picture shows beta tubulin 3 immunostaining, which reflect, detect nerve terminals in the surface epithelia. In the right panel, this table shows the distribution of mascarinic acetylcholine receptors in the different region of the lung. There are more M3 acetylcholine receptors in the large airways, about 48 femtomol per milligram of protein in the large airways, while only 28 femtomol per milligram of protein in the small airways. As Carpocol is the M3 acetylcholine receptor agonist while wondering does carpocol have different effect on electrolyte transport property in large and small surface epithelial cells? To answer these questions, we, re we rely on an in vitro model of um, um, uh, small airway culture. Large airways were dissected from bronchi and small airways with diameter less than two millimeter were micro dissected from non-CF human donor lungs. After Epithelial cells were isolated from both regions. We used the conditional reprogramming culture model uh, to expand the cells. After amplifying for two passages, large and small area cells were cultured at the air interface for two to three weeks. First question we asked if expanded small areas form functional epithelial cells. Indeed, um, Expanded large and airway epithelial cells form well differentiated epithelia. We perform immunostaining on expanded cells. CD80 cell marker acetylated alpha tubulin was stained in green. Small airway marker SCGB3A2 is stained in red, F tubulin in blue. Both large and small airways have robust stadia staining but only small airway have very high level of SCGB3A2 expression. Next, we asked if there's a difference in the gene expression profile of large and small airways. Uh, we used um, 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 bulk RNA-seq to detect the uh, RNA expression profile in the expanded large and small airways. We did find Human and large epithelial cells express unique transcripts in, vi in vitro. Now the panel shows the heat map of some differential expressed gene. Large and small airway express regional specific genes such as ATP12A for large airway and SCGB3A2 for small airway. To confirm this is consistent with native tissue property we immunostained atypical way in human large and small airway tissue. Atypical way was staying in brown color is detected only in large airway, but not small airway. This support that culture large and small airway epithelia maintain some native tissue property and expressed regional specific genes. Next, we used the Wilson chamber to study electrolyte transport property. Here's the schematic to show the protocol to study airway cells in response to various stimulations. We used the chloride buffer for this study. Expanded large and small airway cells were sequentially treated with the following treatment. First, aminorite to inhibit ENAC uh, channel, carbocal to stimulate a uh, calcium act uh, activated chloride channel, F and I to stimulate a CFTR channel, CFTR inhibitor 172 to inhibit the CFTR channel, bimanolide to inhibit the NKCC channel. Left panel shows the representative trace of short current. We, we always use paired culture from large and small airways, which are from the same donors. Currently, we only have data from a long sea of human donors. The black color indicated data from uh, large airway cells, and the blue color trace indicate data from small airway culture. I will use this color code for the rest of my talk. 
after it reached a stable baseline, Aminorite was used to block um, ENAG current. Right panel shows the um, summary data of aminoride sensitive uh, current. Humans might have a similar uh, aminoride sensitive current. Next, we treated with uh, uh, the, the cells with carbocal. There's a big response in the large airway, but minimal response in the small airway. Red panel shows the summary data for carbocal stimulated short circuit current. Human small airway have reduced the carbocal stimulated current. In next, we text the response to the second game P agonist. Large and small airways have similar peak response, but the plateau is reduced in the small airways. Red panel shows the summary data of the um, uh, second game P stimulated short circuit current. Human small airways have reduced second game peer stimulated short circuit current. After second game peer stimulation, we tested the effect of CFTR inhibitor 172. CFTR 172 reduced short circuit current in both large and small airways. Red panel shows safe similar data of CFTR 172 inhibited short circuit current. Human small airways have reduced CFTR inhibitor 172 sensitive uh, short circuit current. Last, we tested the effect of bimanolite. Bimanolite reduced the short circuit current in both large and small airways. Right panel shows the summary data of bimanolite sensitive short circuit current. Human small airway have similar bimanolite sensitive current. In summary, human small airways epithelia in vitro express unique transcripts seen in vivo. Non-CF human small airways have less carbocal stimulated short circuit current than large airways. Non-CF human small airways have lower CFTR conductance than large airways. This model will help to investigate the difference in liquid absorption and secretion, ASL pH regulation, and antimicrobial property of the human small airways in the future. This study is funded by the CF Foundation, CFRA and the recent NHR1. Thank you. Thank you for that great talk, Dr. Lee. So um, you, you allude to this in your talk, but in terms of how this could impact CF research, CF therapies, um, if we think about small airways versus large airways, what, what do you think the implications are? I think, uh, you know, um, since the large airway and small airway have different uh, uh, iron channel um, distribution, I think uh, could be potentially, you know, CFTR modulator have different effect on, on large airway and small airways. I think uh, if we tease out the, the detailed mechanism of, uh, you know, different region, I think that will be help us to, to elucidate, you know, how to better treat the patient. And what do you think about um, potential aerosol uh, therapies that we use right now? You know, we think about the, um, there could be obstruction that only larger airways are gonna see the therapies, maybe not getting to the smaller, or maybe these therapies affect the large and small airways differently. So, you know, what are your thoughts about maybe some of the common things we use like hypertonic saline or? It's a, it's a great question. And uh, I think um, luckily or currently, uh, CFTR modulator or uh, oral PO's. So I think they will reach to large airway and small airway equally. I think in, in terms of um, uh, inhalation, I think uh, they do uh, you know, uh, pose a huge problem for you know, distribution to the small airways. Uh, even for gene therapy, you know, how to deliver the gene ve vector to the small airways, that's a challenge. We should, we should find a way to address that. Yeah. Um, from your bulk seek data, is it possible to determine whether ciliated cells are similar in the large and small airways? I think um, uh, small airways maybe you tend to have uh, less uh, less uh, ciliated cells, and maybe there's more uh, more um, uh, secondary cells, which is uh, consistent with the recent uh, single cell um, uh, you know data from a UNC group. Um, so getting, the, again, just like with the, the last talk, the questions are gonna jump around a little bit between the molecular and the kind of larger. Um, yeah. Sticking more with the molecular, um, one of the questions asked says, I wonder whether the reduced, um, 
ICS response to carbocol is due in part to the lack of submucosal gland properties in your small airway cell cultures as the glands are the major organs in the large airways that express the M1 and M3 receptor. What concentration of carbocol have you used and do you think that's contributing? I think, um, you know, we use the same amount of carbocol, which is, uh, I think it's uh, uh, 10, mini, 10, uh, 10 micromolars. So, um, uh, actually, in the literature, uh, there's a report that say, you know, maybe M3 receptor, um, there's a reduced risk, uh, uh, distribution for the M3 uh, as the coding receptors. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of the carbocal effect, um, I, I, I don't think it can totally be explained by the reduced uh, M3 receptor because basically small airway does not much uh, carbocal stimulated current. And I think uh, maybe there are some other uh, component like uh, G-protein coupled re the receptor to uh, to activate uh, uh, you know uh, intracellular calcium uh, release. So I think uh, maybe you know maybe the the detailed mechanism is not unclear. So. So getting back to the bigger picture related to the question I asked before, um, for inhaled therapies for correcting CFTR, and you alluded to this, do you think we should be mainly targeting large airways or do you think we should be targeting the small airways as well? I think both. I think we should find, uh, uh, find a better device to get the reagent to the distal airways. So that's the best way to, 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 for, the, for the patient, I think, yeah. Okay. And then have you determined how fluid secretions differ in the large airways versus the small airways? Um, no, I think it's still ongoing research. So we want also not just fluid and also look at the pH uh, regulation. And uh, also, I think uh, this, this talk is about uh, host defense. I think also large airways and small airways express different uh, antimicrobials. Like uh, large airway, they express, uh, you know, uh, lactoferrin and uh, lysozyme, but small airways have tons of uh, Surfactant protein D, surfactant protein A, and uh, I think those two regions, maybe the host defensive mechanism is different. Yeah. So as an innate immunologist, um, I'm going to bring the immune cells that we're about to hear about into the Q&A. Um, large airways in, um, in people with airways disease tend to get circulation from um, the bronchial supply, so from the, from the arterial supply, whereas small airways may be getting their circulation more from the um, pulmonary vasculature. Very, and you could have very different immune cells. Have you thought at all about? I mean, your your model is looking at the epithelial cells, but have you thought yeah. at all about how the immune populations in in an organ may be different in the large airways versus the small airways? I think a fantastic question. I, I would love I would love to you know co culture immune cells with a <laughs> different region and to say what's the What's the interaction there? I think that's a fantastic question. And uh, I think we, we tried to model it in the, in the lab. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think actually um, there's work uh, that's uh, being presented at this meeting out of UNC about getting some of the submucosal tissue from the different airways as part of the uh, ex vivo culture model. Um, uh -huh. And one of the potentially exciting aspects of that, um, this is uh, Rihanna Lee's work, that um, you could get the immune cells that are in the submucosa along with the wow. epithelial cells. Wow, that's good. So, that's great. It's a perfect collaboration. <laughs> Set it up right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. I don't see any further questions in the chat. Um, with that, thank I will thank you for your wonderful talk. And we will move to our next talk. Um, so now we're going to move into airway macrophages um, and how in early CF lung disease, they show signs of immune paralysis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Slimmer. I am a PhD student at the Erasmus MC in Rotterdam. And today I would like to share with you some of our work in early CF lung disease, and in particular, the role of airway macrophages. The following relationships exist in relation to this presentation, namely that this work was funded by the following grants. I don't think I need to explain to this audience that progressive lung damage is the main cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with cystic fibrosis. Newborn screening for CF was implemented in the Netherlands in 2011, and in most high-income countries likewise. This early identification of CF has provided the opportunity to investigate the pathogenesis and disease progression in its very early stages, often even before the onset of symptoms. And this has already led to several new insights, for instance, demonstrating that the influx of neutrophils into the airway lumen that is characteristic of CF lung disease starts at a very early age. Additionally, the harmful compounds excreted by these neutrophils contribute to lung tissue damage, 
and a higher amount of both neutrophils and their products in the lung is associated with more rapid disease progression. However, in a healthy steady state lung, neutrophils are typically not the most abundant cell type. The lung is home to a wide variety of immune cells, both in the innate and adaptive immune system. In the bronchoalveolar lavage of the healthy individual, area macrophages make up the majority of cells. Macrophages are part of the innate immune system and are capable of performing a wide range of tasks. They are most known for their phagocytic capacity, engulfing bacteria and debris. Depending on environmental cues, they can either skew towards an M1 or classically activated macrophage, promoting inflammation, or M2 or alternatively activated macrophage, promoting resolution of inflammation and wound healing. Macrophages not only phagocytose pathogens, but also all sorts of organic and anorganic matter, including apoptotic cells and lipids. And they do this through a range of surface receptors. And the term scavenging receptor is used to describe a diverse family of receptors that is found on myeloid cells that directly facilitate the uptake of their ligands. Other receptors also influence phagocytic activity. For instance, serp alpha is a negative regulator of phagocytosis, inhibiting phagocytic, uh, phagocytic capacity when bound to its ligands CD47. Several changes in function have been described in CF airway macrophages. While their absolute numbers are higher in CF lungs than in healthy individuals, and they appear to have stronger pro-inflammatory responses when exposed to microbial stimuli in an ex vivo setting, many of their key functions appear, appear to be impaired. Macrophages isolated from CF lungs show a lower phagocytic capacity for key pathogens, such as pseudomonas, and less efficient autophagy. The pathogens that do get phagocytized are possibly less efficiently exposed of due to dysfunctional phagolysosomes. In addition to the dysfunction seen in CF macrophages, pulmonary inflammation in non-CF individuals has also been shown to greatly impact macrophage function. For instance, it was recently demonstrated in both human subjects and mice that airway macrophages showed a reduction in phagocytic activity after pulmonary inflammation. And this paralysis was shown to last for months after the initial insult and resulted in less efficient clearing of a second infection. So phagocytic function is shown to be impaired both in CF lungs as well as resulting from inflammation in non-CF individuals. However, much less is known about the mechanisms underlying this impaired phagocytic function. For instance, how do the aforementioned scavenging receptors play into this? And how are the macrophages impacted by the increase in neutrophilic inflammation that is a hallmark of CF lung disease? We hypothesize that airway macrophage dysfunction in CF results from an altered expression of receptors that mediate or regulate scavenging. And to investigate this, we set out to characterize the expression of scavenging receptors on area macrophages of young CF patients com and compare them across age groups and levels of inflammation. The samples from this study are derived from the eyeball cohort in Rotterdam. This is a structured monitoring program modeled on the Australian RSTF program. In the eyeball cohort, patients have yearly follow-up visits and undergo bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage every other year at ages one, three, and five. And the expression of scavenging receptors on airway macrophages was detected using a polychromatic antibody panel and flow cytometry. We performed our initial analysis on 26 samples from the eyeball cohort and later repeated it on a similar data set of 36 samples from the RSTF cohort which were obtained using the same sample processing protocol and data analysis. We opted for a set of surface markers that cover a broad range of phagocytosis-related functions, including the uptake of bacteria, hemoglobin, apoptotic cells, and lipid structures. Others, like serp alpha, for instance, have a regulatory function. Each surface marker is labeled with a specific fluorescently labeled antibody, and the relative brightness of each of these fluorochromes is then used to differentiate between different cell types and assess the expression of a given marker on a specific cell subset. Each time, we use standardized beads to ensure that the flow cytometer was set to the same target values in order to be able to compare the measurements. 
Without going into too much detail, we identified airway leukocytes with the common leukocytic marker CD45, and we used CD66B to separate neutrophils from the other leukocytes. We then used two different myeloid markers, CD115 and CD33, to identify airway macrophages. We used two different outcome parameters. First, we expressed the level of neutrophil influx as a ratio between neutrophils and macrophages in the ball samples. And second, on airway macrophages, we assessed the expression of surface markers as the median fluorescent intensity, or MFI. The higher a cell is depicted on this logarithmic scale, the more that particular marker is expressed on that cell. To start out with the results from our own eyeball cohort, we observed that the neutrophil to macrophage ratio positively correlates with age. In other words, in these young CF patients, the lung environment shifts from a predominantly macrophage-dominated to a neutrophil-dominated environment, which is in line with previous reports. We used this ratio to divide samples into quartiles, with Q1 having the lowest neutrophil to macrophage ratio and Q4 having the highest. This quartile stratification was later used to compare scavenging marker expression. One of the markers we investigated is CD163. CD163 is a high affinity scavenging receptor for hemoglobin and also for both gram positive and negative bacteria. We observed that this expression was higher in the youngest group, the one year olds, compared to the five year olds. Here on the left, you see a representative image of what this expression looks like in the flow cytometric data. You see here the macrophage population that was derived using the gating strategy I described before. And on the x-axis is the fluorescent intensity of CD163. And the further to the right this population is located, the higher the CD163 expression is in the cell group. This then translates to a number, the MFI, and on the right you see the expression levels of all samples groups per age, with MFI on the y-axis. As you can see, there are a few outliers, but overall, the expression levels of CD163 on area macrophages decreases with age. In a similar fashion, you see depicted here the results for the CERP-alpha marker. CERP-alpha is a membrane receptor that binds to its lichen CD47, and when it's bound, it causes a decrease in phagocytic activity. So CERP-alpha is a negative regulator of phagocytosis. Again, we see that serp alpha expression is higher in the one-year-olds compared to the five-year-olds, although this is just shy of being statistically significant. We also observe that there appears to be a decrease in variability of serp alpha expression, where the spread in one-year-olds is quite wide, there is much less variability among the five-year-olds. In addition to the age groups, we also stratified the data for neutrophil to macrophage ratio, as I described before, as an approximation of the inflammation severity. On the x-axis are shown the four quartiles, with Q1 having the lowest neutrophil to macrophage ratio and Q4 the highest. Here we see that CD163 expression, again on the y-axis, is lower in the samples that had the highest relative amount of neutrophils compared to the lowest quartile. In contrast, serp alpha expression shows no differences across ratio quartiles. In summary, in the eyeball cohort, we investigated several phagocytosis-related markers, of which CD163 and serp alpha showed a decrease with age and or neutrophil to macrophage ratio. The other markers we investigated showed no altered expression for either age or ratio groups. So for the sake of time, I will not go through those separately. To validate our findings, we performed the same analysis on a similar set of patient samples from the arrest CF cohort. Shown here are the markers that showed an altered expression in the eyeball cohort. Again, you see here the marker expression on the y-axis and the samples either groups per age category or per neutrophil to macrophage ratio quartile, with Q4 again being the highest. Interestingly, neither CD163 or serp alpha showed the same decrease in expression across age groups that we observed in the eyeball cohort. However, both markers were markedly decreased in the highest neutrophil to macrophage ratio. So to summarize, we looked at, a scav at scavenging receptors in two different cohorts, stratifying them either by age or by neutrophil abundance. 
CD163, a scavenging receptor, showed a decrease with both age and neutrophil ratio in the eyeball cohort, and only with neutrophil ratio in the RSCF cohort. CERP alpha, a negative regulator of phagocytosis, trended towards a decrease in age in the eyeball cohort, but in the RSCF cohort, it correlated not to age, but to neutrophil ratio. Coming back to our hypothesis that macrophage dysfunction in CF results from an altered expression of receptors that either mediate or regulate phagocytosis, we have demonstrated that as the disease progresses, either with age or expressed as neutrophilic inflammation, the expression of CD163 goes down. And we speculate that this results in a reduced phagocytic capacity of these macrophages. Moreover, CD163 is often used as a marker to identify M2 macrophages, the polarization state of macrophages that promotes a resolution of inflammation. The hemoglobin that is scavenged by CD163 is converted to heme metabolites that have an anti-inflammatory effect. And the absence of CD163 would indicate that, the, that with increasing neutrophilic inflammation, there is less pro-resolution activity from macrophages to counter this inflammation. Additionally, we observed a decrease in SERP-alpha expression with age. And as SERP-alpha uh, is an inhibitor of phagocytosis, it could be argued that downregulation of this receptor is an attempt to rescue whatever phagocytic function is remaining in these macrophages. Interestingly, this decrease in serp alpha expression was also observed in the study I mentioned in my introduction. In patients with severe inflammation, serp alpha expression on alveolar macrophages was markedly decreased. And this decrease in serp alpha correlated with the disease severity and lasted for months after the initial insult. And this coincides with the reduced capacity for bacterial clearance, and it indicates a prolonged state of immune paralysis. This reduced phagocytic capacity and the reduced resolution of inflammation all contributes to the increasingly neutrophil-dominated environment that is observed in CF lungs, which in turn leads to progressive lung damage. I would like to thank all of our partners in our international early CF consortium, and in particular, Craig Schofield and Vincent Chacalone for their help with the data analysis. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Slimmon, for that talk. Um, macrophages are the most near and dear to my heart, and um, I love seeing really interesting talks about macrophages and CF. Um, I will start with the first question, which is what's become near and dear with specifically to my heart macrophages is understanding the difference between resident and recruited cells. Um, and I'm wondering if you've had the ability to look at if the changes you're seeing in the populations reflect changes in the same population or whether you're getting new macrophages coming in from the circulation that are just different from the resident cells. And the fact that you see these correlations with neutrophils, the neutrophils are a marker that you're getting recruitment of cells from the circulation. Yes, the, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, we do actually think that we see a few subsets of macrophages in, in our analysis. At, at the moment, our, our panel was not uh, suited to to distinguish between those, but we're actually revising our, our panels um, to be able to uh, differentiate between different uh, cell sets of innate immune cells, uh, dendritic cells, different types of macrophages. So yes, that would be uh, a point of interest uh, to, to distinguish different uh, populations. At the moment, I would not be confident saying that based on my data, but I do have a, an inkling that there definitely is such a difference. Um, and it's, it's a particularly interesting population you have because you are presumably having people who are, because they're so young, you have almost a more normal airway initially, although some of the data is showing that the mucus impaction itself seems to lead to inflammation. But as then, as you point out, the neutrophils are accumulating. So as opposed to looking at adults who might be in a more chronic constant state, you get to see the changes happening in the airways, um, which is really fascinating. Um, yeah. Cliff Taggart asks um, if you know if lysosomal function is different in CF macrophages from healthy macrophages. Um, there is some uh, 
there is some literature on that. Uh, there are some really nice reviews on uh, described macrophage function uh, in, in CF. Um, I believe that there is some conflicting uh, evidence. Uh, um, some suggest that there is less efficient acidification of the lysosomes, um, while others say that the, 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 the phagolysosomes work just fine. So I think that the jury is still out on that. Yes, I've seen a number of different studies with uh, conflicting results for whether the lysosomes are, are functional. Um, I will point out Dr. Emanuela Brucia asked a, a similar question. I think you may have already addressed it with my, my question about whether you see, um, if you can distinguish between the resident and the monocyte derived macrophages, and if you're just seeing shifts in populations. Um, additionally, um, do you see any relationship between acquisition of microorganisms and the populations of macrophages? I did look at that, yes. Um, we, we, as you said, we have this very uh, special cohort where you see them at the very early stages of, of disease and, and a lot of our patients still have negative ball cultures. Um, so we have a set that has negative cultures and positive cultures. At the moment, these numbers are too small to really stratify for different microorganisms that are found. Um, so hopefully, as we expand our cohort, we will be able to include that. Uh, we do see with progressing age that more and more cultures become positive, And we also see more higher neutrophil influx. So I think those are very much uh, correlated with each other as well. Are you going to be able to follow this cohort by uh, BAL uh, as they age? Or are you going to stop getting the bronchoscopies? Well, our current cohort is really the very young patients, so one to five, but a lot of our patients at the moment, uh, we don't have the longitudinal uh, follow-up. So we have one-year-olds that still need to become three-year-olds, three-year-olds that still need to become five-year-olds, etc. So we do hope in the following years to really uh, collect a lot of one, three, five, to really get a large cohort of patients in a very early disease uh, process. Um, so getting to your markers very specifically, um, and this is something which, you know, markers are there for a reason. They have functions. And as you point out for phagocytosis, um, do, do scavenger receptors correlate with M1 and M2 status? Um, it would be interesting to see correlation with the surface markers like IGF-1. Do you have any thoughts about other markers that might distinguish your macrophage populations um, and and do you, how confident do you feel that there's really an M1, M2 correlation, especially in this abnormal environment of the lung and CF? I completely agree that markers are not just um, uh, flags for us to be able to tell them apart. Yes, uh, exactly. So um, with, with the M1, M2 distinction, um, I think that uh, it's more useful to think about what the the, 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 the receptor actually does. And like I alluded to in the, in the last few slides, um, the CD 163 marker, for instance, uh, has a lot of functions. Uh, the, the heme that it uptakes is, is, uh, is changed into uh, different compounds and all in different ways have anti-inflammatory properties. So thinking of it in that way, and then of course, therefore it has been used to, uh, to label macrophages as M2, um, which you know, in itself is not a useful distinction, but what does it say about the functioning of the macrophage indeed? Uh, again, yes, we are at the moment <laughs> expanding our, our panels really to, uh, to say more about that. So two questions which, think to, you know, how can you take this cohort and ask broader questions and, you know, whether you could do that. Um, I don't know if any of your patients will end up getting, uh, you know, highly effective modulator therapy. Um, and even if they don't, you know, what will your thoughts be about how that would change these markers you're looking at on immune cells? Um, and then the other part of that, another question that came in is, you know, do any of these patients have exacerbations in the study? And are you going to be able to study how the macrophage changed during an exacerbation? Yes, thank you. That's that's a few. I think a few questions in one. I'll go to the the modulator one first. That's actually very interesting because during the collection of this cohort, 
um, CF modulated therapy was introduced uh, in the very young patients in the Netherlands. So we are starting to have, uh, starting, uh, we, we have now so collected some samples of patients that are on uh, CFTR modulators, still at this moment, not enough to, to say anything useful about it uh, with, this, with these low numbers. But um, that would be interesting in a longitudinal sense, because then we would have these very young CF patients before and after in, uh, induction on, on modulators. Uh, so I'm very excited about that as well. Um, as regard to what I, I expect, um, I am very interested because I, I do think that CFTR modulation in itself can affect macrophage function. And there are some nice in vitro studies that show that, for instance, phagocytosis is at least in part rescued a bit. Um, and also, I think, as a secondary effect of hopefully reduced inflammation, um, you would also uh, see those effects uh, in the lung because uh, um, the study I mentioned, uh, referred to in my, in my presentation, also showed that this sort of uh, immune paralysis phenotype was actually locally induced by the environmental cues in the lung. So if the environmental cues no longer induce this paralysis, hopefully that would aid their macrophages in, in their proper function as well. And then there was a, an, another question. Could you repeat that? Oh, if, if you're going to be able to look at how this might change in exacerbations. Ah, yes, I think this cohort is not the best suited for exacerbations because at this age, well, some, of course, some of them do get admitted with exacerbations, uh, but they are still clinically often very uh, clinically well. Um, especially now if they get introduced on modulators at a very young age, uh, I think we'll get an entirely different yeah, um, population of CF patients, uh, I think, in the future. Um, I, I haven't been able to uh, assess the effect of, of exacerbation numbers in, in this uh, cohort, but yes, of course, uh, clinical status with regards to symptom severity would be interesting to, uh, to correlate the data with. A tough question um, in the chat is um, you, you point out that you didn't replicate the eyeball study with the CF arrest population. Um, yeah. Do you have thoughts about why that might not have replicated between the two different populations? I, yeah, we, of course, we discussed this a lot. Uh, it is very interesting. And I think there are several things and probably all of them are a bit true. Um, so you have a different patient population. Uh, I, you know, there are differences in clinical management protocols and, and uh, you know, they are different cohorts, that's one, but also I think it shows the, the challenges in performing an exactly similar protocol uh, across two uh, investigation sites on different sides of the world, although we took a lot of precautions in making sure that we, we, uh, we had data that we could uh, at least in a qualitative way, qualitative way compare. Um, but yeah, I think um, I'm still not quite sure, actually. I think as we go on, hopefully, you know, we will be able to answer the question more, but it is a very, uh, and a very interesting one. Um, we are running out of time. There's a lot of questions in the chat um, to the audience. We're hoping at the end we can have a group discussion. So please hold on to your questions. Um, I just want to have one last comment from uh, Dr. Brucia, a very astute observation that as um, patients with CF age and they have more recruited monocytes, monocyte drive macrophages in their airway, they tend to have smaller macrophages. So it may be worth looking at if this, the overall forward scatter of the, or the size of your cells change as the patients age as a, as a marker of whether they're having more recruited cells. So Thank you. hopefully we'll have more time to discuss at the end of the session, but with that, we're going to have to move on to neutrophils. Um, so next up we have um, Brian Dobosh um, who will tell us about Grim neutrophils. Um, and um, Brian, why don't you start your talk? Hello, my name is Brian Dobosh. I'm a fifth year PhD student in the Tiruvanzium lab at Emory University. And the title of my talk is The Recursive Production of Extracellular Vesicles Perpetuates Hyperexocytosis by Successive Waves of Neutrophils Recruited to the CF Airway Lumen. Now, I know that's a lot, so what I'm going to be talking about today is that CF airway neutrophils, 
uh, which are highly inflammatory, will fail to kill bacteria uh, and also release their own extracellular vesicles that will cause naive neutrophils uh, to become inflammatory and then release their own EVs. And this will result in a self-perpetuating cycle resulting in chronic airway disease. I have no relationship to disclose in relation to this presentation. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a mutation of CFTR gene. This can lead to dehydration and flaking uh, of the mucus. And this can act as a scaffold for bacterial and fungal infections, uh, which can also induce immune cell recruitment, particularly neutrophils. Uh, and it's gonna be these neutrophils that are gonna be driving CFA disease through the release of their primary granules, which contain highly inflammatory effector molecules. And so it's important to understand how modulators affect each of these components in order to understand what is happening uh, in the airways of patients uh, with CF. Ivacaftor has been approved for use for many years now, so we have fairly comprehensive data uh, that's available, longitudinally speaking. And over the first two years of Ivacaftor use, patients show an increase in uh, percent FEV1 and lung function. Uh, but then after that, they tend to decline uh, in FEV1, FEV1 at the same rate as the comparator group. And on the first year uh, of ivacaptor treatment, patients showed a remarkable decline in the amount of Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, that were present in the airways. But unfortunately, those populations seem to uh, rebound over time. And even inflammatory neutrophil markers like IL-8, which is a potent... Um, neutrophil chemoattractant and neutrophil elastase, which is a serine protease package within the primary granules. Um, these markers have shown a substantial decline, uh, but remain present at still very highly inflammatory levels. And we don't have this kind of data for patients on Trikafta, although I'm sure that is forthcoming. Um, but although there's this massive decline in the number of exacerbations that patients uh, are experiencing, these exacerbations can still occur. All this to say that since lung function continues to decline and inflammatory neutrophil markers are still present and pathogenic bacterial populations are still continuing to expand, we need to investigate what is driving the immune response in order to thwart the pathogenesis of CF. And it's the neutrophils that are the vast majority of immune cells that are observed in the airways of patients with CF. And it's neutrophil associated factors, uh, such as IL-8, which is uh, chemoattractant for neutrophils, uh, as well as neutrophil elastase and myeloperoxidase, which are secreted from the primary granules of neutrophils that are some of the strongest molecular correlates with lung function. Uh, and it's these factors together that are going to be driving uh, lung damage and bronchiectasis, which are the main causes of morbidity and mortality uh, for CF patients. And so when we think of neutrophils, we typically think that neutrophils uh, kill bacteria and, and remove them from the environment. Yet paradoxically, we have very high levels of neutrophils in the airways, uh, as well as very high levels of bacterial populations, uh, as well as other pathogens that are not being cleared. Uh, in fact, uh, we see the, the neutrophils and the bacteria in, in some kind of odd harmony. Uh, where the neutrophils form these cast-like structures around the bacteria, which can be highly inflammatory and, and lead to further obstruction of the airways. And so uh, we're going to describe these neutrophils that uh, choose not to kill bacteria as GRIN. And this is short for uh, primary granule release. Uh, these neutrophils are immunomodulatory and metabolically active. And we've described some other aspects of these neutrophils uh, in that they're transcriptionally active, uh, they're alive, non-apoptotic, uh, they fail to kill bacteria, and they have a very high rate of release of extracellular vesicles. Um, and EVs um, are small uh, lipidated particles, um, typically maybe 50 nanometers to a micron in diameter, that reflect a lot of the host factors that a cell has, such as nucleic acid, acids, um, uh, extracellular proteins um, that are present on the membrane as well as intracellularly, lipid molecules. Um, but they're a way that a cell can communicate with other cells in the environment uh, and have influence over other cells in their environment. 
And because there's so many neutrophils and they release a lot of EVs, there's potential that neutrophils are going to become uh, very influential uh, on the environment and status of the airways. And so when we talk about a grim neutrophil, uh, there's a couple of factors that uh, we've described over, over the years. And in fact, uh, contrary to how some people view neutrophils in the airways, these cells are actually alive and, and non-apoptotic. Um, and these are hyper uh, exocytosing, meaning they're releasing their primary granules, which contain those strongest effector proteins like neutrophil elastase and myeloperoxidase. Um, they're immunomodulatory, where they have high levels of PD L1 and arginase 1 on their surface, which can downregulate T cells. Um, and they're metabolically active, um, where they activate glycolysis, mTOR signaling, they consume a lot of oxygen and nutrients that are present in the environment. Uh, and they are transcriptionally active and they undergo a transcriptional program um, that causes them to not kill bacteria. Um, and then taken together, these phenotypes describe the grim neutrophil. And this grim fate of neutrophils is gonna be distinct from how we are typically viewing other uh, neutrophil fates. Uh, we typically think of neutrophils as phagocytosing pathogens or netosing out their DNA and chromatin, which will result in bacterial cell death. Um, but Grimm is going to be a third distinct fate from these other two fates of activated neutrophils. And it's going to be these Grimm neutrophils that fail to kill bacteria and will end up driving the pathogenesis of CF airway disease. And since neutrophils can be difficult to study in vivo, we've developed an in vitro transmigration model where we can make our own Grimm neutrophils uh, in order to study them. And so the first step of that is to grow epithelial cells at air liquid interface for two weeks in order to differentiate them. And then we can apply blood neutrophils and transmigrate them towards a control chemoattractant LTB4 that will mirror healthier airways. Or we can take the sputum from patients with CF, remove out uh, cells, bacteria, larger debris. Uh, and we call that the CF uh, sputum airway supernatant or CFASN. And if we transmigrate blood neutrophils across the differentiated epithelium into the CFASN, uh, they take on this grim phenotype. And it's important to note that CFDR status actually doesn't matter too much for many components of this model. Uh, the only component that is necessary to induce grimming here is the CFASN, which of course does come from a CF patient. Well, we've done this with epithelial cells that uh, express CFTR or C uh, don't express mutated CFTRs. Um, we have done this with neutrophils that come from healthy donors as well as CF donors. And they all end up exhibiting these same phenotypes as long as the CF sputum is what's being used. And if we use LTB4, they don't take on the group phenotype regardless of their CFTR status. Um, and so these grim neutrophils that are generated in vitro show the same phenotype as their in vivo counterparts where they are granular releasing, immunomodulatory, metabolically active. They show decreased bacteria killing, they are transcriptionally active and they are alive and non-apoptotic. And so the two main endpoints that I'm gonna be talking about in this talk are flow cytometry where I measure CD63 as a correlate for primary granular release, release and a bacteria killing assay where we'll mix the neutrophils with Pseudomonas aeruginosa for one hour and then uh, quantify the amount of bacteria remaining. And just as a, a reminder, a grim neutrophil here will be demarcated by high CD63 and low bacteria killing. So when we transmigrate towards LTB4, the healthy control chemoattractant, we see very low CD63 and high bacteria killing capacity. Um, this is a non-grim neutrophil. Yet when we transmigrate towards the CFASN, the sputum from CF patients, they have high CD63 and low bacteria killing capacity. This is a grim neutrophil. Um, and so this leads to the question of what in the CFASN fluid actually causes neutrophils to take on this grim phenotype. And so uh, when we separated uh, the fluid CFASN by size, we saw that it was a high molecular weight fluid above 300 kilodaltons that was inducing grimming with high CD63 and even lower bacteria killing capacity. As a control, when we transmigrate towards the filtrate, the low molecular weight fraction, we see that uh, grimming does not occur with high bacteria killing capacity and lower CD63. And because EVs uh, contain a mixture 
uh, of uh, that can be contributed by different cells. Uh, maybe some macrophages or T cells that are present, epithelial cells, and of course the neutrophils. We decided to remove the neutrophil derived EVs via immunoprecipitation. And when we remove the neutrophil derived EVs and transmigrate towards the remaining EVs, that does not induce grinning. Um, so this shows that it's the neutrophil derived EVs that will cause the induction of grinning. And as a control, when we remove out the epithelial derived EVs or the macrophage derived EVs, uh, we still see the grimming occurring. So taken together, uh, we have this hypothesis that a neutrophil that is grim will release grimming EVs. And then a naive neutrophil that has just recently arrived in the airways will take up these EVs and then become grim in their own right and then release more EVs that are gonna cause grimming. And this is gonna to lead to a self-perpetuating cycle of airway inflammation. Um, and just to show that these EVs are uh, actually present and highly abundant, we did some electron microscopy to verify that we had spherical lipidated particles. And we use nanoparticle tracking analysis to quantify the size and concentration of EVs. And we see that in adult sputum, we actually see almost a trillion EVs per mil. Um, about half of these end up being neutrophil derived. So there's an, uh, a very large payload of inflammatory grimming EVs that neutrophils are coming into contact with. Uh, and if we're going to thwart the pathogenesis of CF, we're gonna have to come in the way of these grimming EVs. But to prove the hypothesis that neutrophil uh, derived EVs are gonna cause grimming in other neutrophils, we did the same transmigrations as before towards LTB4 or CFASM. We then purified those transmigrated cells and put them into media and allow them to release their own EVs. After that, we purified out the cells so that we had a pure EV fraction. Uh, and then we transmigrated a fresh batch of naive blood neutrophils towards the EVs that originated from a healthy LTB4 neutrophil or from the EVs that came from a grim neutrophil. And we uh, expect or hypothesize that the neutrophils that transmigrate towards the grim EVs will become grim in their own right. And that's what we observe. Neutrophils that transmigrated towards the EVs from grim neutrophils have high CD63 and lower bacteria killing capacity. And this is going to be verifying that a grim neutrophil releases inflammatory EVs, grimming in EVs. This is gonna be taken up by a naive neutrophil that's then going to take on its own grim phenotype. And this is going to be a self-perpetuating cycle, ultimately resulting in chronic airway disease. Um, in summary, uh, we've shown that these neutrophils um, come from EVs and that these EVs uh, lead to this cycle of chronic inflammation. Um, and these EVs are highly abundant uh, in the CF airways. And so an effective treatment for CF is going to need to include both neutrophil targeted and EV targeted therapies. And these grim neutrophils are not just seen in the airways of CF patients. Um, we also see grim neutrophils in COPD as well as asthma and ARDS. Uh, this is a phenotype of a highly abundant immune cell that we are characterizing in the context of cystic fibrosis, but it also has very far reaching applications. Um, so this uh, leads to some interesting opportunities for airway directed therapies. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone that has contributed to this project, uh, all of our funding sources, as well as the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that has allowed me to speak today. And of course the patients for donating um, their, their, their samples, their sputum, their blood for, for these studies. Uh, thank you. Oh, what an exciting talk, Brian, thank you. Um, so, uh, so many, so many questions. Um, I really compelling data that these EVs are are um, causing the phenotype of new neutrophils. What's in the EVs, Brian? <laughs> Have you yeah, guys started a, breaking that down question. yet? And then, I guess the other thing is, um, do you know if these are granules? They say toast. Are they truly vesicles? Like, do you, do you know how they're being made? Yeah. So as for, for what in the EVs is actually causing this process. We're, we're working through that now. Um, we, we have found that when we treat the EVs with UV light that this diminishes the capacity for grooming to occur. So this strongly implies that it's um, a nucleic acid and likely an RNA of some kind. And so we submitted uh, samples for RNA-seq um, right now. 
And, and so we're working through some of that data. Um, secondarily, we've also been looking at some of the transcription factors and, and transcriptional modifiers that are uh, on the neutrophil side of things to see if we can come up with some uh, key, key factors that can cause a neutrophil to undergo that transcriptional program and become grim. Uh, I will say there's that, that was my question, but there's like two other questions in the chat that are literally that question. What are the cargos and what, what are the molecules that are in there? So everyone's got the same question. <laughs> yeah, no, so so absolutely. Um, yeah, so we, we are going along the route that it's an RNA, um, but you know, all the other components of the EV are also going to be important for inducing brimming. I mean, for example, a neutrophil derived EV is gonna have CD66B on its surface and CD66B has been shown to have homotypic adhesion. So neutrophil derived EVs are more likely to aggregate and bind to a neutrophil. So this is a way that a neutrophil can direct its cargo towards specifically a neutrophil as opposed to an epithelial cell or a bacterium that's floating around. Uh, the lipids that make up the EV uh, can, can fuel beta oxidation and can be a fuel source, especially when we talk about the lower airways not being a prime oxygen rich environment. Um, and, and of course, all these structures are highly glycosylated, and so lectins that are on the surface can, can also uh, result in uptake or even act as decoys uh, for, for uptake. Um, Dr. Manuel Abrucia asks, do the grim neutrophils share characteristics with the high-density neutrophil population frequently associated with severe lung disease? Um, yeah, so we, we haven't characterized the, the density of these actual grim neutrophils. Um, so, I, so I don't have a great answer there. Um, yeah. Okay. So to be, to be announced someday. Um, do you know if the grim phenotype can be reversed? Yeah, so we're definitely working through that. Right now we're thinking that if this transcriptional program can be induced in, in neutrophils and, and cause them to be grim, then there should be key siRNAs and transcriptional inhibitors that we can be, be using. And so uh, we had shown that just uh, inhibiting RNA polymerase two um, with a drug called alpha mantin just shutting down transcription actually does prevent the induction of GRIM. Um, and this did work in, in ex vivo uh, speed and patient samples and invigorated them to kill bacteria. Um, but whether the GRIM phenotype can truly be reversed, uh, has, we're, we're still figuring that out. Uh, because some of those results can just be invigorating naive neutrophils that haven't become grim yet to, to fulfill their, their bacteria clearing abilities. So you just mentioned that UV light seems to affect the cargo. And so you're thinking it's an, an mRNA or some kind of nucleic acid. Um, Antonio Ricuti points out um, that there's been some characterization and you can go to poster 571 that looks at protein cargos of EVs from people with CF. So um, sure. It may be a very different phenomenon, but that was one question I had been thinking is, are you gonna just do proteomics on the EVs to see if there's something that pops out? Sounds like you're already focusing more on the nucleic acids. We are definitely going towards the nucleic acid probe, but we're, we're in the process of doing um, some untargeted proteomics uh, with, with um, some of our collaborators, um, especially because again, you know, the protein cargo can of course uh, augment some of these abilities uh, either through increased targeting, perhaps escape from the, the endolysosome, um, or trafficking to other organelles. Um, and so all of these components are going to be relevant, uh, and, and none of them can be ignored. So do you know, you know, obviously this is about the neutrophils that migrate into the lung in CF, but do you have any idea if grimming might happen or could happen in the circulation? Um, yeah, so I'm not uh, too sure if typically all these changes um, happen during or after the transmigration process. So I think a grim neutrophil would, is typically going to be a neutrophil found in a tissue, and we're mostly talking about the airways here. Um, but, but one could think about seeing a grim neutrophil in the context of sepsis, which is unable to completely clear away bacteria, or um, maybe in, in, in particular cancers. Uh, but, but as for, I think how some of us are, are viewing a grim neutrophil, I don't think I would typically describe a grim neutrophil as being in circulation. Um, of course, maybe a, a neutrophil, which is in the tissue, maybe a reverse transmigrates or something like that, but that's probably a very small population. 
Um, do you know, in terms of this killing uh, phenotype that you're seeing where they seem to be less able to deal with bacteria, is it pathogen specific? Yes, so we've repeated um, this data with Staph aureus as well as, as Haemophilus. So it, it, it is at least separate from the gram negative versus gram positive bacteria. Um, as for, for being pathogen specific, be, so beyond that, we, we don't have too much other data, um, but it, the grim phenotype does seem to exist for other pathogens. Okay. Um, have you put the um, neutrophil EVs, uh, the grim EVs on other immune cells to see if there's effect? As you point out, the CD66 could be a, a, a homotypic interaction, but do you, have you looked, you definitely look to see if other EVs affect the neutrophils. So have you done the reverse? Um, yeah, so we, we've seen that neutrophils and the, the EVs that the neutrophils secrete can um, transfer active caspase into the epithelial cells and it, that can and activate inflammasome signaling in the ALI cells. Um, and then this can lead to the release of further I1 alpha and I1 beta, also leading to increased inflammation in the airways. Um, and then how these neutrophil EVs can affect baby bacterial populations we haven't looked at uh, too closely yet. Excellent. Um, I think some of these, so we answered about grim phenotypes being reversed. Um, I think you're in terms of EVs affecting other cells. So, so you think, is there, what, is it a specific interaction? I mean, you did mention CD66 um, and, and, you know, being on the EVs and that might cause them to interact with neutrophils um, or can these, do you think these confuse, you just mentioned interacting with epithelial cells, are there receptors? Are these just fusing with other cells? Yeah, so I, I think one day when, when EV technology improves and we can do much more targeted like single EV um, biomarkers, uh, I think we can get a lot closer to that population. I think eventually what we can try to do is, is specifically label EV population and see whether they preferentially go into different cell types and start to delineate some of those ligand receptor relationships. Um, in addition so to, to CD66B and various integrins that can also promote binding, uh, neutrophils and, and macrophages and other immune cells are also highly penocytic, uh, more so than the epithelial cells. And so they're going to be sampling that, that, that environment and perhaps taking up uh, EVs at a greater rate. Uh, and so these, these you know, small particles are going to go to different cell types preferentially. And even when we think of therapeutics, like a lipid nanoparticle, which gets inhaled, you know, that's going to be hitting the immune cells first, then a mucus barrier, and then the epithelial cells are probably the likely targets. Um, and so we, we really have to, to figure out how each of these cells are interacting with small particles, EVs, LMP, something else, viruses, uh, before we can really start to envision a truly successful blanket therapeutic for CF. Um I know we have very little time left, but we just got the last interesting question, which is, you know, the control for CF is always to look at airway surface liquid or cells from another similar lung disease. So have you looked at ASN from other conditions like COPD or non-CF bronchiectasis to see if that induces the grim phenotype? Um, or do you think it's very specifically the CF um, environment? Yeah, so we've used sputum from adult C COPD patients, and we see a very similar grim phenotype. We've also used tracheal aspirates from uh, young patients um, who, who have uh, acute ARDS. Um, and that does induce a grim-like phenotype, but there are some distinctions, and this probably talks into something, some differences between acute versus chronic disease. Um, but, but a lot more remains to be done. Well, thank you very much, Brian. That's a great, great story. And obviously there's so many questions we all have that, you know, we'll uh, hopefully continue to develop moving forward. Um, we'll now switch to our final talk. Um, I am I'm sad to tell the audience that unfortunately our speaker was, is not with us. She did pre-record the talk. Um, so we will hear about Resolvins um, by Dr. Pumilio um, in a pre-recorded talk. Um, any uh, questions you have for her, um, she has asked that you email her um, and we will post her email for you. Um, and then if there's time at the end, um, we will have um, discussion with the group, although we are running up against the end of the session. So um, we'll go ahead with her talk and then we'll, we'll potentially be able to have a group chat at the end. 
Hi everyone, and thanks for allowing me to present my data in this workshop. For this project, we studied the action of Resolving D1 and Resolving D2 in cystic fibrosis, MRSA, lung infection, and inflammation. Acute unresolved inflammation and chronic infection are key mechanisms responsible for the progressive destruction of airway in cystic fibrosis, representing the main cause of morbidity and mortality. As reported in the table, cystic fibrosis airway inflammation is characterized by uh, the uh, subsequent hallmarks. It begins in early life, is disproportionate to the degree of infection, starts and or persists even in the absence of, of inf infection, never resolves. The main pathogens responsible for respiratory tract infection in uh, CF uh, patients are Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas serruginosus. As reported in the CFF patient registry data, Staphylococcus aureus and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus are emerging pathogens in recent years, and in particular, lung infection due to, due to uh, MRSA often lead to disability and even death in people with cystic fibrosis. Resolution of inflammation is an active process where endogenous mediators derived from polyunsaturated fatty acids and called specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators have important function. They are the poxin, E-series resolvings, D-series resolvings, protectins, and moresins. We know from the growing literature and our previous work that, along with CFTR dysfunction, the resolution of inflammation is defective in people with cystic fibrosis, contributing to the development of lung disease. Among SPM, we focus on resolving D1 and resolving D2 because they are the most characterized SPMs and by specific receptor, as shown in figure on the right. Resolving D1 binds FPR2 and FPR2 and uh, GPR32 receptors, while resolving D2 binds the GPR18 receptor. Given this background, the aims of the, the work were investigating the protective role of the solving D1 and D2 in lung inflammation infection triggered by MRSA in preclinical models of cystic fibrosis, and also defining activities and modes of action of resolving D1 and D2 in urine and human systems. To test whether resolving D1 and D2 promote resolution of bacterial infection and inflammation, we first determined their bioaction in a mouse model of acute MRSA lung infection. Mice were challenged with endotracheal instillation of plantonic MRSA and a single dose of resolving D1 or D2 was administered by oral lavage three hours after infection. Lungs and bronchoalveolar lavage were collected at one day after infection. As you can see uh, in figure A, both treatments, resolving D1 and D2, significantly reduce the number of total live bacteria counted in the lungs, demonstrating the effective bioaction of bacterial clearance. In addiction, they reduce bronchoalveolar lavage accumulation of the total leukocyte and neutrophils, as in figure B and C. The decrease in macrophages occurred only in resolving the one treated mice, probably indicating a fixing action of resolving D2 on the recruitment of these cells during infection. Notably, resolving the one treatment induces a significant reduction in keratinocyte derived chemokine KC in a bronchoalveolar lavage. KC is an index of neutrophil recruitment during infection, and this result confirmed the previous described effect of resolving D1 neutrophils. In addiction, the actions of resolving D1 and D2 on inflammation were confirmed by a general trend toward reduced histological science of lung inflammation, such as parenchymal involvement, airway inflammation, granulocyte, and lymphocyte infiltrate. In order to determine action of resolving D1 and D2 on chronic inflammation, it was important to establish 
the temporal evolution of long-term lung infection with the clinical MRSC strand. Mice were infected by endotracheal distillation of MRSC embedded in agar beads, which allows bacteria to survive in their cellways for a long time. Infection inflammation indices were monitored at 3, 7, and 14 days post infection. Under embedded MRSA trigger a long lasting bacterial infection in mice and a sustained inflammatory reaction characterized by a persistent significant accumulation of total leukocyte neutrophils and their weight tissue damage. Notably, an increase in macrophages was observed at 14 days concomitant with an improvement in some histological science of inflammation and lung damage, such as lympho lymphocyte infiltrate. So, uh, given the time course analysis, we tested whether resolving D1 was also effective in reducing chronic MRSA uh, infection when um, given at the peak of infection. To this end, at seven day post infection, mice uh, endotracheally infected with the uh, agar embedded MRSA were randomized to receive resolving D1 or vehicle every uh, 48 hours up to 14 days. Treatment with resolving D1 led to a significant reduction in lung MRSA title, total leukocyte, neutrophils, as well as macrophages number. Furthermore, resolving D1 reduced pro-inflammatory proteins such as interleukin-12, interleukin-13, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, KC in this case, and GCSF. Remarkably, resolving D1 improved survival of MRSA-infected mice and weight recovery indicating a better health status for the animals compared to vehicle-treated infected mice. So uh, to, to define the cellular mechanism uh, activated by resolving D1 and D2 to improve microbial clearance, phagocytosis of uh, Staphylococcus aureus by neutrophils from healthy versus cystic fibrosis subject was carried out. To this end, Staphylococcus aureus, the pH of bioparticles, and cytofluorimetric analysis were used for the assay. The phagocytic capacity of blood neutrophil resulted, resulted significantly lower in, in cells from volunteers with cystic fibrosis, as reported in Figure A. And treatment with resolving D1 and D2 significantly enhanced about 20% phagocytosis of Staphylococcus aureus by neutrophil from healthy donors, as well as uh, CF uh, donors leukocyte, as reported in Figure B. The enhancing effect of resolving D1 and D2 was also confirmed by a dose response curve analysis, Figure C. Cystic fibrosis macrophages were in vitro infected with planktonic MRSA, then treated with resolving D1 and resolving D2. As reported in the graph, uh, resolving D1 and D2 treatment increased TNF alpha gene expression in macrophages of uh, cystic fibrosis donors compared with vehicle treatment, calculated as a relative uh, expression over non infected cells. So, in conclusion, resolving D1 and D2 reduce pulmonary inflammation and bacteria titer in acute and chronic MRSA infection in vivo. They both enhance bacterial clearance, activating the neutrophil phagocytosis. So, uh, these results indicate that resolving D1 and D2 are beneficial against MRSA infection and inflammation, pointing these uh, findings as a prototype of innovative therapeutic strategy for cystic fibrosis based on the exploitation of the endogenous resolution mediators. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you everyone. As I mentioned, unfortunately, we don't have the speaker here to answer questions. Um, and she said she'd be happy to take any questions you have um, via email. 
Um, but this does give us time now. Um, we, we're having a lot of questions for many of our other speakers. Um, first, I would like to just personally thank everyone who spoke in the session today. I think the talks were excellent. Um, the amount of questions we got shows that the audience really enjoyed the talks as well. So thank you um, for contributing to uh, NACFC and to this workshop in particular. Um, thank Dr. Ray Pickles, who has been behind the scenes um, helping field the questions. Um, and as well as the support staff at the at Freeman and um, at the CF Foundation. Um, but if the audience is still around, um, this is your opportunity to continue asking questions about epithelial cells, about small bronchial epithelial cells, grim neutrophils, macrophage paralysis, and young children. Um, many opportunities. Or if somebody wants to jump in and tie it all together, um, we're happy to think about. I mean, one thing that makes this all really challenging is that. You can phenotype cells and you can look at cells uh, outside the body in a dish, but as it's been very clear from this talk, the epithelia affects the neutrophils, the neutrophils affect the macrophages, um, and trying to parse that all out uh, gets very complicated. So um, any, any, any thoughts from our panel of, of speakers? Any speakers want to ask questions to each other? Well, we're certainly not going to hold people uh, long. It's I know it's the end of a long day. Um, I'm sure our speakers would be happy to respond to questions via the networking on the on the uh, NACFC portal or through their emails. Um, and um, please definitely contribute to discuss these topics and ask questions. Um, I know a lot of these uh, talks are just going to be made into papers, and people could use as much feedback as possible. Um, Dr. Pickles, do you have any further thoughts before we finish up here? No, I think that was a wonderful series of talks and I appreciate everybody's efforts that they put into making sure their presentations went smoothly. And also thank you to the foundation and to uh, Paul who has helped us through all of the technology. Really well done, fantastic, thank you. Thanks, everyone.